Okay, welcome everyone. We're going to dive straight in and get started. Um, I can see we've already got over 400 uh, people online. So thank you and welcome to everyone for joining this, uh, this webinar. My name is Tony Goldner. I'm the Executive Director of the TNFD. And uh, we've got a fantastic uh, lineup of speakers today, um, both from the CBD Secretariat and from the TNFD and from our, uh, our colleagues at Business for Nature as well. So we're really uh, here today to, to reflect on what was achieved in Montreal with the new global biodiversity framework and how it connects to the TNFD framework. Of course, uh, the global biodiversity frameworks provided us with a fantastic set now of global goals and really defined the global ambition for tackling nature loss. And there are lots of different touch points with uh, the work that the task force is doing at the moment. But we're going to focus this discussion in particular on target 15 which is the target that calls for assessment and disclosure of nature-related uh, dependencies, impacts, and risks. So let's dive uh, straight in. Uh, I want to welcome our speakers, but before we do that, we'll just run through uh, the agenda. Uh, so we'll have a, a bit of context at the beginning. I'm delighted to welcome Elizabeth um, Marema to, 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 the, to the call today. Uh, Elizabeth, of course, is one of our co-chairs at the task force. Uh, but she's also the executive secretary of the CBD Secretariat and did a masterful job of na navigating uh, proceedings in Montreal back in December. Uh, so honored to have Elizabeth with, her, with us today. We have Camille Maclet from uh, Elizabeth's team at the CBD Secretariat. Uh, Camille was very involved in, in the um, process of setting up the discussions and, and also the finance day events, which highlighted the uh, engagement of the business and finance community. We then, have, we then have Mayo Pellison from Business for Nature. Mayo was integral to the uh, negotiation of the Target 15 text, representing the voice of business. Um, we'll then have a Q&A in case there are questions from everyone online uh, for that group of, of, of speakers about the broad context and what was achieved uh, at, at, uh, at Montreal. And then we'll dive into linking it to the work of the task force. And Emily McKenzie, our technical director, uh, is online and will take us through um, where we're up to in building the framework. And she'll be joined by Marianne Haar, who is a key member of our team in developing and leading a lot of the, uh, the guidance at a sector and biome level that we're pushing forward. Um, we'll then have a Q&A uh, and open it up for questions. And so hopefully it's going to be a, a good and lively discussion. Just a few pointers as we, um, as we get started. Uh, some tips here for your viewing experience. Uh, we will have the Q&A function open. I would just ask, given the in, uh, large number of people online, we're now almost at 700, uh, to please keep your questions as questions. They should end with a question mark. Um, what, we, what we'd like to try and avoid is filling up the Q&A uh, function with comments. So please pose your questions. Uh, we've got a team in the background who'll be reviewing the questions coming through and we'll pull out as many of those as we can and post them to the speakers so that we can make this as interactive as we can. Um, so good questions are short and they obviously end with a question mark. So uh, let's dive in. Um, if we go to the next slide, please, Eliza. I just also wanted to mention, uh, we've, we're, we've got with us a couple of our task force members, Alexis Gazzo from um, EY and Judson Berkey from uh, UBS. Uh, they've been driving a lot of the work around guidance development and metrics and targets. So as we get questions from the audience, um, we'll bring Alexis and Judson into the conversation so that you get a sense about the, how the task force is working through some of these uh, issues in our work um, as we go forward. Great, so let's get started. Um, I thought I, I would just do a quick recap on the task force. I'm conscious there's probably a lot of people online who might be joining us for the first time. Uh, for those of you who are TN TNFD forum members, welcome back. Uh, some of this might be a little bit familiar to you, but for those of you who are new to TNFD, our, our mission is to develop a risk management and disclosure framework for nature-related uh, risks and issues. Uh, we're covering impacts, dependencies, risks, and opportunities. And our ultimate objective is to contribute to the broader goal of shifting the flow of global finance towards uh, nature positive outcomes. And of course, that, that is the overall guiding mission uh, and goal of the global biodiversity framework as well. 
Uh, the task force started our work about 14 months ago in late 2021. Uh, we're a market-led initiative with 40 task force members, uh, backed by the support of the G7 and G20 government uh, groupings, and uh, very much taking a science-based approach to our work with the support of a fantastic group of knowledge partners. Where are we up to today? Uh, here are some of the headline numbers that we sort of keep track of. We're really delighted by the level of market participation and the engagement of a wide range of other stakeholders. The TNFD forum is now over 900 institutions strong. Uh, we've got a terrific group of knowledge partners from the scientific bodies to the standard setting bodies that are supporting our work. Um, and a large number of other groups that are contributing as well, who are not uh, core knowledge partners, but making a fantastic uh, contribution to the to development of the framework. We've had a very large number of uh, views and, and ex signals of interest in our work uh, through, the, through the beta framework, um, which we'll talk about in a minute, which is up on our, on our website. Uh, lots of feedback coming in. We're doing this in an open iterative process and we're really Delighted to see so much engagement and suggestions, uh, constructive criticism. It's all very welcome in helping us to try and get to the best possible version one of our framework in September this year. Um, I'm also delighted to say we, we because of the focus of, uh, on the data issues, we um, have created something called the TNFD Data Catalyst, and that's now crowded in the support of over 120 uh, data providers from some of the world's largest data providing companies to new startups building the next generation of tools and technologies. So that's a very vibrant community that's helping to try and figure out the solutions to uh, many of the data challenges that I'm sure are on your mind. And we've also got over 150 institutions now pilot testing the early draft of the framework and helping to um, inform our ongoing design efforts. So a lot of interest, a lot of engagement, and we're just incredibly grateful for all of the support that many of you are providing. If you're not already a TNFD forum member, um, a quick advert advertisement here, please do consider joining. Um, as I mentioned before, there's over 900 institutions in the forum across um, over 50 countries and territories and most sectors of the global economy. And so, we certainly welcome uh, all of those of you who are interested in what we're doing and not yet TNFD forum members to join and you can find details on our website. So where are we up to in the process? I mentioned we started in late 2021. Uh, we've been doing this in an iterative process. We're using a sort of software analogy of beta versions and version releases. Um, we've published the three draft versions of the framework or beta releases of the framework. Our next uh, draft framework, the final draft, will be coming out in March uh, this year. And um, in, in, in about five or six weeks time. And uh, we're driving towards publishing the task force's final recommendations uh, in September this year. So we're on track for a September release of our recommendations. And um, we've been very, very busy in the last 14 months, um, bringing in as much uh, input and feedback and ideas from across the science community, business and finance community, and other stakeholders, civil society, indigenous uh, community leaders, et cetera, as possible. So what is it that we're aiming to produce in, in very simple terms? Um, first of all, a set of disclosure recommendations for those of you um, doing climate reporting and familiar with TCFD. Our disclosure recommendations will be taking the same structure, approach, and language as the TCFD, and will look extremely familiar. Linked to that is a set of additional guidance for market participants to start acting on their nature-related um, issues and challenges. Um, and that guidance is going to be by sector, by biome or ecosystem type. Uh, it's going to cover things like scenarios, uh, where to find uh, data and metrics, et cetera. So together, we call that um, the, the combination of the disclosure recommendations and the guidance that what we call the TNFD framework. In addition to uh, the TNFD framework, um, we're throwing up a lot of ideas and, and identifying a lot of problems and challenges and opportunities in the broader enabling environment, which will ultimately contribute to the success um, of the adoption of the TNFD and mo moving the needle on nature loss more generally. And so we're planning to put forward a series of 
other recommendations about what else needs to happen uh, beyond uh, what, what TNFD can contribute. And many of those recommendations are, as I mentioned, for example, on the data side being developed uh, right now in a very collaborative way with a wide range of other stakeholders and market participants. It's also uh, worth being clear about what we're not doing. Uh, TNFD is not trying to write a reporting standard. Um, that, that is, as many of you will know, is the job of organizations like the ISSB. Uh, GRI has been uh, doing impact reporting standards for, for a long, long time. And of course, then national and regional regulators like the European Union or national governments will refer to uh, recommendations like those of TCFD and TNFD and put those into their own standards and regulatory processes. So we are providing a set of recommendations and we hope to inform the work of standard setters uh, going forward. So one of the things that I think is helpful is, uh, I'm sure many of you are working on climate and um, uh, climate reporting at the moment. And so it's helpful to think about making the analogy between or the parallel between what's happening on the climate side and how does that now lead into action on nature. Um, there's lots of things that need to be in place in order to drive corporate and financial institution action on climate, as we've seen. But at the core of it is a set of um, arrangements to provide clarity around particularly metrics and targets. And as you can see here, what's the reason why I think we're making so much progress now on climate reporting and climate uh, related assessment, risk and uh, impact assessment, is because the, the basic building blocks or the puzzle pieces are now in place. We have guidance at the global level with the Paris Agreement on what the targets should be. The unit of analysis and the metrics have been clear for many, many years with the GHG protocol. And that's cascaded down into at the national level through things like nationally determined contributions, um, government commitments, um, and even down to the local level. And when, when we say local, we, we mean at the level of companies, institutions, cities, local councils, even local communities. And so on the climate side, we've now got the architecture for action largely in place. But if we now look at the, on the nature side, uh, some of those key pieces of the architecture um, are, are not, yet, uh, not yet in place. They're still work in progress. And so um, we obviously now have, as of December, the Global Biodiversity Framework, which now provides us with a sort of North Star for what the international community wants to achieve at a policy level. Um, governments have been working on uh, national biodiversity strategies and action plans for, for, for many, many years. Um, but there's, there's these missing gaps in the architecture and there's a lot of organizations, if we can move to the next slide, please, Eliza, there's lots of organizations, including TNFD, who are working to try and address some of these key pieces of the architecture so that we can accelerate action by corporate, corporates and financial institutions to contribute to the global challenge. We're only one of those players, but we're working really closely with scientific organizations, other framework initiatives, the standards bodies, government regulators, et cetera. So I, I, I think there's huge progress being made. The, the pace of change is quite remarkable, um, but there are some significant challenges in, in terms of putting all of this architecture into place so we can accelerate action on nature loss. At the core of the TNFD's framework is uh, thinking and, 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 and move, moving for action on four key elements of the challenge. One is, Dependencies, the dependencies of companies and financial institutions on nature, on businesses' dependencies on nature, um, the impacts we're having on nature, and then what that means for the risks and opportunities to business going forward. And so we, at the center of our thinking and the center of our approach is this idea of dependencies, impacts, risks, and opportunities, and how they're connected, how they relate to each other, um, and how we can provide a architecture of metrics and targets to provide that information and make those disclosures more effective. What's really helpful, if we go to the next slide, please, is um, the, the global biodiversity framework language in target 15, which we're going to talk about today, is really, really well aligned with the TCF, the, sorry, the TNFD's approach. Um, the language of target 15 talks about dependencies, impacts and risks. So, we're very excited that the TNFD is now really well placed and very aligned with this language in the global biodiversity framework so that we can help operationalize 
and achieve the objectives of Target 15 as it's been laid out in the Montreal Agreement. Before I hand over to Elizabeth, I thought it's also maybe worth just a couple of quick reflections on what we're seeing in terms of global momentum uh, on this agenda. And it's worth thinking about this through four different lenses. The first is policymakers are now um, placing much greater importance in a very, obviously a very crowded global agenda of complex issues. But what we've seen in the last few years is that nature is now uh, at the top of the risk registry and it's now commanding uh, more concerted attention from policymakers. And um, uh, the G7 statement last year um, referenced the work of the TNFD as one of the parts that's going to be contributing to taking more effective action. Um, we're also seeing more action and, and attention from central banks and regulators. So as many of you will know, the world's uh, collection of central banks looking at these issues is called the Network for Green in the Financial System, the NGFS. And in March last year, they published this um, uh, quite important discussion paper, which basically acknowledged that biodiversity and nature are now alongside climate change as systemic risk issues. And so, of course, when central banks um, uh, reach that conclusion, uh, that typically triggers uh, a lot of other actions, including things like stress testing of financial systems and financial institutions, and so we can reasonably expect now, and we're starting to see that that work is, is, uh, is, is now coming into place. Uh, standards bodies uh, are also uh, moving into nature. Um, GRI has been, of course, working on this for, for many, many years on the impact side. Um, many of you will be watching closely the developments of uh, the, the, the new creation of the ISSB. Um, ISSB and you know, IFRS are one of the knowledge partners of the TNFD. And uh, they signaled in December that they're going to be drawing on the work of the TNFD as they uh, start to move uh, some of their attention uh, later this year into the issue of nature and biodiversity. Obviously, they've been very focused in the, in, since their creation on general requirements, their S1 standard, and also uh, their climate-related standard S2. And so we're, we're, we're looking forward to working closely with them as their focus uh, starts to increase on nature. And finally, from an investor perspective, um, I just wanted to bring your attention to this statement earlier this week, actually, from Aviva. Um, what we're starting to see is more and more attention from a stewardship perspective from investors asking questions of companies about how they are responding to nature-related impacts, dependencies, risks, and opportunities. Um, we were delighted to see this statement from Aviva this week, saying that this is one of their top three stewardship priorities for 2023. Um, and actually calling on companies to start uh, exploring the TNFD framework and starting to use one of the components of our work called the LEAP process to begin identifying and assessing uh, their nature-related uh, issues. So really important that the investors are moving. They're gonna start asking more questions through, through shareholder um, disclosures and shareholder recommendations and, and um, uh, propositions. And so, all of these uh, factors, I think, are driving up the nature, nature-related corporate reporting agenda quite quickly. So how does this all fit together? Um, again, where are we at on climate and what does the parallel look like for nature? This is just a very simple uh, representation of the architecture that's now in place for corporate reporting on climate. Many of you will be very familiar with this. We have the policy ambition and the global policy direction of, of the Paris Agreement that's aligned with, uh, with the frameworks like TCFD and SBTN, the SBTI, the Science-Based Targets Initiative and many others. Um, that's informing standards and it's obviously informing uh, regulation. And as we've seen around the world, a number of countries are now uh, mandating TCFD aligned uh, reporting on climate. And so it's a very similar picture that's now starting to come into place on nature. Um, we now have, uh, thankfully, uh, the, the Montreal Agreement, uh, the Global Biodiversity Framework. That is going to be, as we're going to discuss today, a reference point for the TNFD work and, of course, many others, the Science-Based Targets Network and others. And we'll see a similar pattern of uh, those frameworks informing the development of regulatory standards. So I think the architecture is coming into place. It's all moving very quickly. And um, we're certainly trying to do what we can to make sure that that's informed and driven by uh, market experience, um, as well as uh, policy ambition. 
So let me stop there. I want to um, introduce you to uh, Elizabeth Marema. So um, as I said, Elizabeth was leading the effort in, in, in bringing us to Montreal and negotiating the global biodiversity framework. So Elizabeth, the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tony, uh, for that uh, well-captured introduction on the work of TNFD. Uh, greetings first to all the participants uh, to this event. I think to start with is probably, we might be asking ourselves, yes, what happened at COP15? Uh, and we know that by the time we uh, delegates arrived in Montreal, virtually the whole world was waiting uh, for that outcome. But there was a reason behind that. Let us remember all the scienti recent scientific reports, recent economic reports, and how they have reported on the impacts of our human being relationship with nature, impacting species, impacting uh, soil, impacting agriculture, impacting forests, uh, and yet uh, businesses, financial institutions equally be impacted as the result of the loss of biodiversity. So bringing all these together, we reached the global reached a point whereby virtually all sectors of the economy, all sectors of the government felt the impact of the loss of biodiversity and the urgency of taking action. And that action is what led everybody to Montreal. One, two, we had the, uh, the previous biodiversity strategic plan and the each biodiversity target for which none of the targets was, were met. And yet the impacts increased as the result. So there are many lessons learned from that failure. And key and relevant to our discussions here is the non-engagement of uh, all stakeholders in the development and implementation of the previous targets. And this is what now brought on board virtually all stakeholders and delighted that the financial institutions, corporate bodies, business became key and provided that historical participation during the uh, Montreal Conference of the Parties. And this is for the first time in the history, 30 years history of the convention. And Tony has clearly indicated the impact of that participation, which led us to having now that clearly uh, coached uh, target 15. So the historic Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, which has adopted, also is accompanied with the practical means for implementation. Again, to ensure that by 2030, we don't come back to the same story that we have failed. And you know, the scientists have told us this is our last chance. And of course, for business financial institutions, it's not just the last chance. It means the business is the economy globally will collapse if nothing happens. So what then was uh, achieved uh, in, uh, in Montreal? Many aspects or many decisions were taken, in fact, about 69, but we know for the world, the primary principle awaited one was the now the global, new global biodiversity framework, which gives us that shared vision, a long-term shared vision of living in harmony with nature by 2050, and is supported by the action-oriented targets for 2030. And these are the 23 targets which my colleague Camille will go into detail. There was a whole lot of campaign uh, before Montreal uh, of having a specific target on um, protected land, uh, terrestrial and marine areas of 30 by 30. So that found its place uh, there is that apex conservation and restoration target. We, are, we have targets addressing not just over exploitation of biodiversity, but also pollution and sustainable agriculture practices, climate change, virtually all issues have been uh, addressed. 
And as Tony uh, showed the connection between climate and biodiversity, but you can expand that biodiversity nature basically cuts across uh, everything we do. And that's why you see pollution there. You see uh, 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 agricultural issues, forest issues, fisheries issues, and you name it. Also, the, what was, is key also in the new framework is the aspect of fair and equitable sharing of the benefits, particularly and in including the digital sequencing information on genetic resources. And we need to understand here, this aspect of DSI or digital sequencing information, negotiations have not been completed. So a decision has been adopted to continue those negotiations. Uh, and the decision also include uh, again, means of implementation in terms of looking at an establishment of a multilateral mechanism for the ensuring that equitable sharing uh, of benefits, uh, how it will be effected. The framework clearly takes into account uh, what we'll say safeguards in terms of protecting uh, the rights, the participation of indigenous peoples and local communities, recognizing their contribution and stewardship in nature. And it's not just the IPLCs, women, uh, the youth, uh, the business, the finance, the governments, the NGOs, civil society, virtually all stakeholders can see themselves in this framework. And that's why we are saying it is a framework, it's universal in its application, framework for all, whole of government, whole of society uh, approach across all sectors of economy. So literally, it's not just business, it's not just finance and corporate, it's even you and me to contribute uh, to its implementation. So the gender responsive approach has been underlined, uh, providing that rights and equal opportunity to women and girls, particularly target the last target uh, uh, 2023. 20, uh, so we hope that the lessons learned from the previous failures, the scientific underpinnings, the economic underpinnings, social underpinnings, all have led to what was adopted uh, in Kuming. And what we have uh, in Kuming is a package deal. Package deal in terms of we have that framework global biodiversity framework adopted, but it has been adopted together with a monitoring framework, together with a, a planning, monitoring, review, reporting mechanism framework, a strategy for uh, resource mobilization, uh, action plan for capacity building, development, technical and scientific cooperation, including also action plan for gender, gender action plan for the implementation of the framework. And as I said, also that specific decision for further process going on on digital sequencing uh, information, which will continue to be led by the secretariat. So probably within the five minutes, I will stop here to give Camille to go into the deep dive of exactly what is inside uh, that uh, framework and what it means for the financial institutions and the work of TNFD. Thank you, Tony. Thanks so much, Elizabeth, for that uh, context. Um, terrific to hear the, the background story. So Camille, uh, you're the finance lead at the CBD Secretariat. Um, great if you can take us through in a little bit more detail, um, Target 15, uh, well, what the GBF is in total and, and Target 15, and then we'll uh, bring Naila into the conversation from a business perspective. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tony, and thank you very much, Elizabeth, for your um, uh, for that introduction. Um, before doing that, I will really very quickly emphasize what Elizabeth said in introduction, that is that we saw during COP15 um, a historic and in fact a first of its kind engagement and advocacy of businesses and financial sector organizations in co calling in favor of an ambitious global biodiversity framework. And I will not go into the detail of the various campaigns, but amongst those were, of course, the voice, the very strong voice of Business for Nature 
calling negotiators and leaders to make disclosures mandatory as part of the uh, Montreal Economic Global Biodiversity Framework. So now about the um, uh, Global Biodiversity Framework, if I can go to the next slide, uh, I will not take you through the detail of the framework. Um, this would be way too long, but schematically, um, the structure of the GBF is um, uh, underpinned by a, what we uh, refer to as a shared vision of living in harmony with nature by 2050. This is the vision of the framework. It's a 25 year vision. Um, this is essentially, I mean, if I were to summarize it very quickly, this is about um, biodiversity being valued, conserved, restored, wisely used, maintaining ecosystem services, um, sustaining a healthy planet. So sounds idealistic, but it is um, um, the right uh, definition for the level of ambition adopted at the framework. This vision is underpinned by four goals to uh, be achieved by 2015. Uh, goals A, B, C, D, um, which refer to uh, ecosystem and species conservation, sustainable use of resources, equitable uh, sharing of benefits uh, from nature and from the digital sequence information on nature. And very importantly, goal D on the means of implementation, um, i.e. to a large extent, not only, but to a large extent, financial resources in support of um, achieving the framework. This vision and those four goals to 2015 are supported by 23 action-oriented global targets to 2013. And again, it would be overly long to um, go through detail of those targets now, but um, suffice to say that they, they are grouped into three main groups which includes reducing threats to biodiversity and improving conservation and restoration, meeting people's needs, including, of course, equitable benefits sharing uh, and a just sharing of um, uh, resources. And uh, thirdly, but not, uh, not, not least, um, securing the tools and solutions for implementation of uh, the framework. And this includes target 15 on disclosures that we will uh, talk about in more detail today. On the key concepts that um, we have in the GBF for uh, the finance sector, but also for corporates, um, without going into the detail of how they relate to goals and targets, um, let's say that the first key concept is about mainstreaming of biodiversity, that is making sure that biodiversity is integrated into decision-making processes by organizations. Second, the concept of aligning financial flows, which is, which sounds very um, consistent with um, uh, paragraph 2C uh, of, uh, uh, of the Paris Agreement. Aligning financial flows is about um, um, generating new finance for biodiversity, but also reducing risks and impacts from um, over from, from the bulk of financial flows and investments. Very importantly, within the framework is the leveraging and encouraging investments from the private sector um, to generate new resources towards biodiversity conservation and to align financial flows, i.e. to reduce risks and impacts and therefore support conservation. All of those concepts uh, are um, to, to a large extent underpinned and supported by the concept of disclosures on risks, dependencies, and impacts, which are in target, um, uh, in target um, 15. And I think I have the text of target 15 in the next slide, if Elisa, you can, you can show it to us. So the target 15 on disclosures, um, I simply cut and paste the text here of target 15, and I encourage everyone to read it at their own pace. Um, what is very important in that target is that um, the text um, establishes a commitment by the parties to, to take policy and legal action to ensure that large and transnational companies um, assess and disclose their risks, dependencies, and impacts on biodiversity. 
along their value chains, operations, uh, and uh, portfolios. As Tony said in introduction, um, even though the TNFD is not referred in that text, um, the wording, uh, especially of Supergraph A, is very consistent with the um, uh, with the spirit and the purpose of the TNFD. And I will emphasize the bottom paragraph, which is the uh, end objective of Target 15, which is to uh, support a progressive reduction of impacts on biodiversity, of risks and impacts to companies, um, and uh, an increase of positive impacts. And in that, I think that we are again in this target very much consistent with uh, the spirit of the uh, TNFD. I will finish on um, uh, the monitoring framework. Um, the, the, the monitoring framework is a separate document, which is as part of this package deal that Elizabeth referred to of texts adopted at uh, COP15. Um, this includes, this defines a series of headline indicators for monitoring the achievements of the goals and targets of the GBF. There is in that document a set of indicators related to target 15 and also to target 14 on mainstreaming. And um, probably today, um, what I would underline is that uh, the, the, the TNFD is referred as um, a framework uh, against which the monitoring uh, of mainstreaming and or disclosures um, should be done. So a lot of that is still work in progress because this is for the CBD and the parties to implement in practice. But we have here a landscape that allows for a strong integration of the TNFD within the uh, monitoring framework in the GBF, and in particular within the monitoring of the disclosure target uh, of the uh, GBF. I will stop here. Please feel free to uh, contact me uh, or the Secretariat, of course, for any further question on the GBF. Thank you very much, um, Tony and the TNFD team, for giving us an opportunity to present this. Thanks very much, Camille. So hopefully that gives everyone a sense of uh, what was in the Global Biodiversity Framework and specifically uh, what, what was uh, being called for in Target 15. Uh, let me now invite Mael to, to join us. Um, Mael, Mael was tirelessly uh, representing the voice of business uh, at COP15 and um, uh, I know you played a, a big role on working through the negotiations on the text of the Target 15 language. So Mayo, maybe you can give us some perspectives of what it was like in Montreal and, and, and where you think we've come out. Um, we've had some questions on the chat function around, uh, you know, there was this campaign about getting the word mandatory into the language, but the word the mandatory language isn't there. So, um, but the, the text is quite robust in many ways calling for requirements. So, Maybe you can answer that in your comments and just give us a sense about where you think we've got to. Um, obviously, it's open for interpretation, but love to hear your perspective on, on, on the process and where we've, where we've landed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony, and good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, yeah, so first of all, I'd like to start by saying that Business for Nature really strongly welcome um, the Target 15, as we believe it sends a very strong signal to the business community that government will soon be requiring all large business and financial institutions to assess and disclose not only their risks, but also their impact and dependencies on nature, including along their value chain and portfolio. So we are very pleased to see this outcome because actually, if we look back in the negotiation process over the last year, the debate around the mandatory disclosure has been evolving very rapidly. And I think less than year, a year ago, such a strong outcome would have was looking quite impossible. So actually, um, the concept of requiring businesses to disclose was introduced in the text for the first time in March last year during the third negotiation session of the GBF. So at the time, Business for Nature was already advocating to make this disclosure mandatory. But in most of the discussion we were having with governments, governments were unclear on why this was needed what it would bring and, and how it would actually work in practice. 
So ahead of the fourth negotiation session that took place in June in 2022, we organized a business consultation with around 200 businesses and we asked them if they would support the, the concept of mandatory disclosure in the agreement. And actually we saw an overwhelming majority that responded that yes, they want to see that in an agreement. And that actually around 91% said, yes, we need that. And the main reason they gave us really helped us also um, engaging with government. So they say, that they need mandatory to be uh, disclosure to be made mandatory because it really helps leveling the playing field, ensuring fair competition. It demonstrates the urgency. It would also accelerate the standardization of all of the of the standards, and it would also help businesses to access the data that they need so that they can accelerate their action on on reducing negative impact on nature. So we went in the fourth session of the negotiation with a very strong mandate from the business community. And when we started, again, continuing those discussions with government, we also realized that the governments had quickly evolved uh, on the topic and that the momentum was really growing. Um, government were recognizing also that by requiring businesses um, to disclose, this would really help accelerate action and, and create this business case that is needed for business to invest in nature. We also heard a very strong call from the investors because they also need this information to be able to realign their financial flows. It would also help empower the consumers to make informed, case, informed choices. But more importantly, what we heard from government is that as they were negotiating the different targets, and especially the targets on business in the framework, it was very hard for governments to be able to adopt targets on re reducing negative impact by a certain percentage because they realized they didn't know exactly where the impacts were, the scale of the impacts, because disclosure was not mainstreamed. So they really re started to realize that making mandatory uh, disclosure mandatory for every business was the essential first step for efficient government policy and, and setting targets. So at this stage, government still had many questions on how it could be implemented, that they were also very confused with the lack of existing framework or many frameworks supporting these targets. But by that time, as we went in Montreal, what felt like um, a long shot in March appeared to be more and more possible with more and more buy-in both from governments and, and, and businesses. So in the meantime, the the momentum, the business momentum also has been growing. Um, as, as Camille mentioned, in November, we launched the Make It Mandatory campaign, where we had more than 400 companies who were calling uh, governments to include the mandatory assessment and disclosure in Target 15. And many of those companies actually came to Montreal to COP15 and got really engaged in the discussion. They really helped in this discussion with the governments, providing clarity on how this could be implemented. TNFD was obviously um, uh, in the middle of the discussion as an obvious great place to start. And, and it's really thanks to all this engagement from businesses that we reached this, 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 this outcome. And actually one of the observer um, was, was telling us that any panel that had a business speaker from our community turned into a make it mandatory discussion. So it's really this first time that so many businesses were really engaged in pushing for the ambition. So that led, to, so we also led a very active engagement with governments. We had meetings with governors one by one to really explain how those requirements could be implemented. And now the result is the one we all know. So very strong consensus from all governments that indeed business and financial institution must be required to disclose their risks, their impact and dependencies. As you mentioned, uh, Tony, at the end, the word mandatory was not included in the text on actually only because one country uh, would not agree the all the other countries were were in alignment and and you need consensus in the cbd but the final text of the target is very clear it really clearly states that government will ensure that all large businesses and financial institutions including RIV requirements will need to assess and disclose their risks impact and dependencies by 2030 so we've seen this momentum growing so fast from March to December last year, and we can only expect that it will continue growing now that it's been adopted. We actually, um, when implementation starts, there's already a, a lot of encouraging signs from governments. The EU uh, mentioned recently that their understanding was that Target 15 implies the need for mandatory measures, and that's the way they're going to work with governments around the world to make sure it's implemented in this way. Uh, a few weeks ago in the UK, uh, the, the UK ministers at Goldsmiths was making a debrief of COP15 to the UK Parliament, and he said very clearly that the UK was looking at making uh, nature disclosure mandatory um, following the publication of the TNFD recommendations in 2023. 
So we also received a lot of very positive feedbacks from the business community, which is now turning massively to TNFD to get support uh, for the implementation. And I think this, this engagement and excitement is reflected by the number of people participating in this webinar today. Um, so I think now it's really over to TNFD. We've done the, the work and uh, we're wishing you a lot of success because the pressure is on, on you guys and all eyes on you. So good luck and thank you so much, Tony. Thanks very much, Mayela. Um, and hopefully that's answered one of the questions in the chat around the up, there was a question around the uptake of nature standards, will it be faster than climate standards? I guess we, we don't know the actual answer to that, but I think Mayel's just outlined that there's huge momentum now, um, both from policymakers, uh, as I mentioned before, from regulators as well, um, uh, on the nature side. So, you know, hopefully it's going to catch up. Um, hopefully we'll see a uh, fairly fast adoption um so so that and that was uh, in response to one question there was also another question in the chat around requirements and what does requirements mean um and i think mayel touched on that the word requirements is a sort of indication that governments will need to uh, provide guidance to business and finance about what's required even though the the, the word mandatory was not included um, I do just want to, we're, we're running a little bit behind time. Uh, there's lots of questions coming through and I think a number of them will be answered in the next session with, with Emily and, um, and our other colleagues. So I'm gonna hold off on a lot of questions, but there was one question that I might invite Elizabeth to take um, if, if Elizabeth can come back on screen. Um, there was a question around uh, what might we expect from the next uh, the next COP in terms of uh, implementation following on from the global biodiversity framework. So, um, uh, Elizabeth, uh, of course, you don't have a crystal ball, but um, based on the based on I've the responded to it already in writing. Oh, you have okay. Well, maybe maybe yeah. maybe um, maybe it'd be good just to get your sense about following the momentum from Montreal. What would you expect of the next COP? As I've indicated uh, uh, on the chat. A lot is expected by the next COP, and the next COP is actually next year, uh, probably towards the end of uh, October. Key from the countries will be the updates and uh, uh, review of their national biodiversity strategic plans, uh, their determination of national targets, hopefully the learning again from the previous failure, aligning from with the GBF. Previously, we had that gap. Uh, countries are expected also to develop their financial, national financial plans as part of the resource mobilization for implementation. Uh, I indicated when I spoke that discussions on DSI digital sequencing information continue and hopefully by the next COP to have an agreed that multilateral mechanism to be established. Uh, from the market participants, we hope we know by the next COP, the framework will be finalized, adopted, launched, and hopefully we'll be able to count, hopefully the more than 900 uh, participants we have basically adopting the TNFD framework in their own decision-making process. So a lot of work ahead of us. We are only talking months to the next COP, and I hope together we'll, make, we'll begin to make that difference because also the, mon the indicator framework, uh, indicators for, the uh, for monitoring framework ought to also to be completed so that then different stakeholders can begin using them. So a Very lot good. ahead of us. Very good, thanks so much, Elizabeth. Um, I'm gonna move straight on to, to Emily so that we can get into uh, what is the task force doing to help operationalize target 15? Um, there's been a number of questions around, around that already in the chat. So um, great, great to see people expecting uh, this conversation. So over to you, Emily, to sort of take us through where are we up to in responding to this challenge and how is it going to work in practice? Thank you, Tony. Yes, I will build on, on what you've heard um, from Elizabeth and Camille and just provide some more detail on the TNFD framework itself. Um, and I will focus on how the two frameworks, the TNFD framework and the global biodiversity framework are aligning and coming together. There are already some key points of conceptual alignment. And we're also actively working with the CBD Secretariat in the alignment at the more in the weeds level on indicators and metrics, uh, building on the CBD's monitoring framework that Camille mentioned. 
um, and, and look at how all of that can underpin and support the achievement of the goals and targets in the framework from corporate and financial institution action. But let me just start at that level of conceptual alignment. Tony's already laid out how the TNFD framework thinks of nature and business depending and impacting on nature. Nature is an asset that's providing these critical services. Um, and such as clean and regular, regular water supply. Um, what we then uh, have as core in the flame, what framework is understanding how those impacts and dependencies can create risks and opportunities for organizations. Um, that can occur through a change in the state of nature, through the change in this flow of benefits, ecosystem services, um, and the impacts on the organization and, and wider society. And just like with um, TCFD, we think of uh, nature related risks as these potential threats that are posed to an organization linked to those dependencies and impacts, and that they can be physical transition and also systemic risks. So physical risks are a direct result of an organization's dependence on nature, it might be an example of a decline in soil biodiversity leading into a decline in the ability of an ecosystem to, to provide soil regulation of soil fertility and then having to compensate for that for applying fertilizer at you know significant cost and then you've got just as you do for climate uh, nature related transition risks which would come from when there's a misalignment between an organization or a, an investor strategy and what's changing in the regulatory or policy or or, or, or social landscape in which they're operating um, and then in addition, we look as, as the um, central banks, you mentioned NGFS are looking at systemic risks, but we also see that as relevant for organizations because there could be a breakdown of an entire system, whether that's a tipping point in an ecosystem or um, sort of interlinkages between organizations in the financial system that might mean um, uh, there's a, a, a sort of trigger of a chain of reactions that, that creates risks. And then on the opportunity side, you know, uh, opportunities also for avoiding and reducing and mitigating or managing these impacts and, and risks and strategically transforming their, their business models and their products and their services um, and their investments. So um, we're looking at it both on, on the risk and opportunity side, but also how all of that is, is relating back to dependencies and impacts on nature. So that's our conceptual framing. And as, um, as you can see clearly from, from Elizabeth and Camille's presentations, um, this relationship between nature and impacts and dependencies and risks is also centrally in the global biodiversity framework, particularly target 15, which um, the TNFD framework can then help to operationalize. It's a, what I said here is a sort of a process oriented target for, for organizations to regularly monitor and assess and disclose risks, dependencies and impacts. So very clear connection on target 15. Um, but what we're also developing um, is going to enable a, um, as it's a, a framework for disclosure, but also assessment and management of all of this, it can enable them to inform their decisions and transparently disclose how they're contributing to outcome uh, targets that Camille showed. And I've just given one example here. This is one, I think there are many more targets um, that are relevant, but targets two and, and three of the global biodiversity framework, um, which are in about ensuring that by 2030, at least 30% of areas um, that are degraded are effectively restored. And target three, which is um, ensuring that by 2030, at least 30% of um, ecosystems are effectively conserved and managed through um, effective protected areas and other measures. You, we starting to examine those targets and through looking at the indicators in the monetary framework, seeing how the TNFD framework can enable organizations to see, see clearly and disclose to the outside world how they're contributing to those outcome targets. So in this example, and this is all still in development, looking at metrics that would um, align with targets two and three. So um, the area of land, freshwater, ocean use change, the area of land, freshwater and ocean that is voluntary, voluntarily conserved or restored. So we've already taken a, an extensive mapping exercise of the targets and indicators in the monitoring framework, and we're looking closely at how the, those in the TNFD framework can align and build on what's there. Um, and we'll continue that work. It's still, um, TFD framework is still a beta, still in development, but it's been tremendously helpful that the outcomes in Montreal now enable us to um, continue to co-develop as we get to the more detailed uh, guidance.
And I just mentioned on the bottom here, the black box, because a number of questions in the chat have related to this. In developing all of this, we're not only looking at the global biodiversity framework, it's obviously centrally important for us, but also working with other knowledge partners to draw and align on what's in other evolving nature and biodiversity standards, such as those being developed by the International Sustainability Standards Board, the Global Reporting Initiative, and the European Sustainability Reporting Standards that are being developed by AFRAG. So it's a, we're building up from the standards as well as um, the global biodiversity framework. So if we can move to the next, thank you. So what does this all feel like and look like in practice to a user? Um, what will it look like when version one comes out in September? At the heart of the TNFD framework sit a set of disclosure recommendations and the structure and content and language of TCFD on climate has been used as the foundation for this. And that's to ensure consistency and familiarity for, for those in the market who are already using TCFD. But it's also to encourage, and I saw another question in the Q&A about this, to encourage and enable an integrated um, set of disclosures around climate and nature. So that integrated approach to sustainability reporting, which we know the market wants to move towards. So we've extended and adapted and um, in some cases supplemented those recommendations in ways that are needed to cover nature. Um, and they remain under review. Welcome feedback. Uh, our deadline is the 14th, just to remind everyone on the feedback. Uh, so Tuesday next week, I think that is uh, for feedback on our latest beta release and we'll continue to refine it. But this is um, uh, gives you a flavor of where we're at. And so you'll have a set of users will have a set of recommended disclosures and underneath those, just as with TCFD, a set of guidance, disclosure guidance, implementation guidance for how um, to go about each of those disclosures. And also we envisage providing some annexes on indicators and metrics um, that could support report preparers when they're applying recommendations. And, and those will be cross sector, but potentially also metrics that are um, tailored by sector and by biome, because we know that for nature, so much is location specific. And again, I saw a question in the chat about how can you make this granularity and location specific nature of nature work in a global framework. So that's how we're envisaging it. There'll be both cross-sector and sector and biome specific pieces. So in a nutshell, when you use the TNFD framework, when it comes out in version one in September, you'll have a set of disclosure recommendations, supportive guidance, and a set of metrics to work with. So if we can move to the final slide from me, um, since the launch of the TNFD market, participants have, 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 have told us that simple, accessible guidance on how to understand and respond to the issues raised through the global biodiversity framework dependencies and impacts on nature and the risks and opportunities that arise from that would be a really useful complement to a set of disclosure recommendations. And that's why in the TNFD framework, we've gone beyond just a set of disclosure recommendations, but to provide an integrated assessment process, um, which we call LEAP. And the acronym LEAP comes from locating your interface with nature, evaluating your dependencies and impacts, assessing your risks and opportunities, and then preparing to respond to those risks and opportunities, improving your decision-making and reporting against them through disclosure. And stakeholder engagement is an absolutely an integral runner at the bottom throughout all of this. So the LEAP approach has now been tested. I think we have over 160 pilot organizations who are now involved in pilot testing. So we'll continue to refine and, and learn this. Um, and the LEAP approach is, is voluntary guidance. It's intended to support internal assessments um, to inform strategy governance risk management decisions um, but that includes disclosure decisions it's not in itself a disclosure rank recommendation nor is it sort of a mandated process um, to adhere to the disclosure recommendations so it's it's suggestive um, and not everything done needs to be disclosed but the task force has been clear that these are the requirements the components in leap would be required for a robust assessment process so um, it would be expected that all of these components would be would be covered in an, an internal assessment process that an organization does so that's what you will experience in the in the uh, september when version one um, comes out you can already see our beta approach uh, underlying the leap approach will indeed be additional guidance by sector and biome just like for the disclosure metrics so um, I'm, I'm pleased to hand to Marianne next, who's going to give a flavor of that, including um, on one of the sectors we've been looking at first for agriculture. Excellent. Thanks, Over to you, Marianne. Thank you so much, Tony. Uh, thank you so much, Emily. So yeah, 
I'm taking us a uh, level down in granularity to look at our sector specific guidance and biome specific guidance and unpack a bit for you. What does that look like uh, in the middle of designing this? Um, next slide, please. So the specific guidance of TNFD will be published through the TNFD interactive online portal that you know today. And it will provide both cross sector and additional, it will both have cross sector and additional sector and biome specific guidance in a customized dashboard for users. So you will not see a pile of PDF documents, but actually a digital user journey to take you to exactly what do you need to know in your exposed sectors or sectors of operation. So this will be made available to market participants um, with the launch in September. Next slide, please. So while the TNFD recognizes that every non-financial sector has an impact on nature and is affected by nature-related risks and opportunities, the TNFD has developed an initial list of its priority sectors, identifying the sectors that you see on the slide and industries that are more likely to be financially affected than others uh, due to their exposure to dependencies and impacts on nature. The sectors are on the slide, and you will also see that we have aligned with ISSB and SASB, as em Emily also mentioned, and the biomes are aligned to UNCA, which is another way to align to the GBF um, framework. Next slide, please. So if we look at the sector guidance level, so how do we work with designing, designing that? There we are also aligning the content with existing both voluntary and regulatory standards because it's a rapidly evolving market. So at the voluntary standard level, you see some of them on the slides that we are engaging with both as knowledge partners, but also to inform our work. And it's really what I work on is the sector specific guidance for food and agriculture. And there we of course work with the supplements to these guidance that are specific to that sector. So for instance, for GRI, we look specifically at GRI 13, which is on agriculture and aquaculture. And the same, we look at SPTN, those that are related to, to and specifically important to uh, agriculture and SASB the same. We look at the sub industries related to agricultural products, meat, dairy, and poultry, et cetera. And we're also aligning with the rapidly emerging regulatory standard landscape. As you also heard from Emily, we are in close dialogue with FRAG developing the European standards, but also on the opportunity side, since we are both doing risks and opportunities, we are of course very informed by the uh, taxonomies that are coming and being introduced by the regulators across a number of jurisdictions. Now, the aim is thereby that TNFD is not sort of that additional framework to fractionalize an already fractionalized market, but it's really that it can become that interoperable framework for integrated and consolidated reporting that can be applied across jurisdictions, no matter what your regulatory landscape look like. So of course, since December, and which is the theme of this discussion today, we have been deep diving into what does the four targets say and the 23 goals in the global biodiversity framework and the draft indicator framework that we heard Elizabeth and Camille talk about. And then we've been looking at, of course, how can we ensure that also at the sector level, not only at the cross sector level, but how can we support with the sector guidance companies to really align in their business model and their disclosure to the GBF. Next slide, please. So as with the overall TNFD framework, which is based on an open innovation process and a science base, the same goes for the sector guidance. So the logos you see on the slide are merely a few of the expert institutions that we are engaging with to ensure that the sector guidance for agriculture and the other sectors you saw on the slide and the biomes, that that guidance is really informed by what is the best available scientific knowledge in the market. In terms of content, that is what you see here on the slide outline, the six elements of the content. I won't go through all of them, but just to let you know that the content is only what is sector specific, so additional to the overall framework to help reporters prepare their disclosure. So for instance, if we look into the concepts, it's only those concepts that are in need of clarification for a company to disclose specifically for that sector. So for agriculture, uh, the agriculture guidance, for instance, we clarify terms such as food waste and food loss. What is that? 
to enable companies to disclose, but also to make sure that disclosures become comparable, because that is one of our design guiding principles. Then we go into the steps of LEAP that Emily showed on the slide to say, okay, what's specific for this sector? How do you locate your interface with nature and assess the integrity of the ecosystem with that interface? And of course, for agriculture, it's defined by most of the listed companies do not necessarily own and operate land. So they have to figure out how to locate my interface with nature through very long and complex supply chains. So we try to guide the companies of how to do that for these specific sectors. And then the last element before I round off and, her and hand it back to Tony is what you see in the box at the bottom right hand side of the slide. And it's really to allow you to take a peek under the hood into the sector guidance, into the machine room of how are we working with design of sector specific metrics that are as aligned as possible to the GBF agreement. So what you see in the box is the draft elements of an assessment metric, because as we heard Camille talk about Article 15A, focus on dependency disclosure, but also on your impact disclosure and on your risk disclosure. So the example you see is of a sector specific metric that we are working on. So this is very work in progress and draft for pollution, the impact driver of pollution with a focus on nitrogen leakage to the environment in the food and agriculture sector. Nitrogen leakage is part of GBF target seven on pollution. It reads, part of it reads to reduce pollution risks and the negative impacts of pollution from all sources by 2030 to levels that are not harmful to biodiversity and ecosystem functions and services, including reducing excess nutrient loss to the environment by at least half, including through more efficient nutrient cycling and use. So this is key to agricultural guidance, of course. And then the example you see, uh, an example of an impact driver that we are working on, on nitrogen in the guidance. And in this example, the impact driver needs to capture leakage because that's what the GBF tells us into the environment because that is the focus here. And that is also the driver of nature loss. So linked to the greater goals, the four goals of the GBF. So it is therefore the currently um, impact driver we're looking at is nitrogen use efficiency because that actually captures the leakage and then for companies to assess that against the state of nature. And you see two indicators there that are both taken for the complementary indicators of the GBF monitoring framework. Just to round off, this guidance is part of, again, the open innovation process, and we're looking very much forward to engaging all of you in maturing the thinking and really designing it. Thank you, everyone. Back to you, Tony. Thanks so much, Marianne. Um, really helpful overview of where we're up to in developing the guidance. Um, just building on Marianne's last comment there um, about the opportunity to provide feedback. Um, there's been a number of questions in the Q&A um, about where are the disclosure metrics, where can I find um, the sector guidance. So uh, all of that's coming uh, with the disclosure metrics are going to be released in draft at the end of March. And so everyone will have an opportunity to, to, to provide feedback and comments on that. Um, so that's coming in March. Uh, and then we'll be progressively releasing the sector guidance when it's ready over the coming few months. So whenever we have those releases, we tend to uh, message out to the TNFD forum members and then we'll advertise it more generally. Um, and of course, all of that's in draft until September. So there'll be plenty of opportunity for everyone to offer their comments and provide their input, both on the metrics uh, for disclosure as well as the sector guidance and frankly, all of the other aspects of the framework as well, which is, as Emily said, it's all, it's all in draft and we're doing this to try and get as much feedback as we can from all of you. Um, I want to just uh, go to some questions. We've got a huge number of great questions there. We, we won't get to all of them, uh, but we've been sort of aggregating them into, into themes and topics. And I'm gonna invite uh, some of our um, panelists and task force members to take these questions. I might start with you, Emily. I know you have to um, dash, dash, dash off a few minutes early. Um, there's a, there's a, been a few questions around TNFD, TCFD, how are we working together? Um, uh, how are we thinking about aligning and, and finding opportunities for alignment between the approaches? So uh, we've got a great relationship with them. Maybe you can say a few words about um, how we're thinking about the alignment with TCFD. Thanks. Yes. So right from the beginning, we've um, been in regular um, 
conversations with the TCFD Secretariat. Obviously, the TCFD is now um, been consolidated into the ISSB, and we remain in touch with the TCFD team there and with the ISSB in, in large, so remain in regular touch. And um, by design, the task force, as I said in my overview, has structured our disclosure framework, the disclosure recommendations, along the same structure um, and indeed the content and language for the TCFD so that we have that consistency and um, enable an integrated approach. If I'm just more specific than I was in my overview, in simple terms, TCFD outlined 11 disclosure recommendations. Um, we're currently proposing 15. This may evolve as we come to the final beta release. We're, con we're continuing to get feedback and discuss with the task force um, uh, the, these, but at the moment there are 15. Um, nine of the 11 TCFD's disclosure recommendations have actually been directly carried over from, TCF, uh, from TCFD because there's um, this makes sense to do so. Um, then there are two TCFD disclosures around, um, say, referring to emissions and scopes or scenarios that have, we have done some adaptation. And then we have these additional new draft disclosures, which are looking at topics that we, the task force has felt are really critical for nature, things like the location specificity of your interactions with ecosystems in particular places. So, um, so that's that's how it works. We use the same four pillars of governance, strategy, um, risk management, and metrics and targets, with one current variation in the draft of looking at risk and impact management. And, um, and that's all been done by design, is to allow this integrated approach. And we'll continue to remain in good touch, as you said, Tony, with ISSB and the TCFD team as we finalise the the framework. Yeah. Yeah, just to emphasize, one of our first principles when we started was to try and align with as the structure, language, and approach of the TCFD, and I think we've been very consistent in trying to carry that carry that through. Um, conscious that we've got to work with where everyone's up to on their climate uh, reporting. Um, I want to turn to the another question that was asked. Uh, I think a very good provocation um, was: is is disclosure by business too late to bend the curve on nature? So. I can see our other co-chair, David Craig, has joined. Um, David, why don't you uh, offer your perspective on the role of disclosure in, in the broader public policy challenge? And then, Alexis, I might invite you to offer your perspective working for one of the world's biggest uh, professional services firms that mm -hmm. does audit and assurance. Thank you, Tony, um, and greetings, everyone. It, it's a very interesting question. There's two ways of interpreting it. Um, so I'll have to try and use my own interpretation, but the two ways are, one is, uh, have we destroyed so much nature and biodiversity that we're too late with TNFD? Um, and the other one is, our disclosures are rear view mirror and actually businesses need to act earlier. Um, I think the honest answer is disclosures demonstrate accountability. Um, people look at disclosures for many different things. Sometimes they look at them as a way of kind of policing or catching companies out. Sometimes they want to have data or comparability and there's various uses. But when companies say that they're willing to disclose, what they're really willing to do, I think, and from my experience, having run business is to say, we're gonna take accountability for the issue. And in this case, it's the accountability of really assessing those dependencies and impacts, those risks um, from nature-related risks. So um, disclosures to me are the tip of the iceberg. If you've been able to do the disclosures and do them properly, you've had to have done your homework several years ahead, I think, uh, to have gone through the process and use something like LEAP to assess your business system, your upstream and your downstream and really understand the model. So whilst they may seem like they're rather late in the process, most disclosures are from the previous year's data. The activity to generate them, if you've done them correctly, should mean that you're actually investing ahead to do that work. Great, thanks, David. Uh, Alexis, uh, firms like yours are at the front line of helping companies prepare disclosures and obviously things like providing limited assurance. Um, what's what's your take on uh, on this question around? You know, is it too is it too late now? What's the role of disclosure in the bigger picture? Well, I mean. Perhaps a, a bit in the same line as as David, uh, you know, it's a question of a, of glass half, half empty full or, or, or sorry half empty or half full. Obviously, yes, it's definitely probably late when you consider the state of nature and considering the reports that we're getting from a number of NGOs. Uh, but having said this, if you look at the brighter side, I would say uh i i'd like to make a few comments one is that uh if we compare to to climate and we you know talked a lot about tcfd versus tnfd 
Uh, you know, it took us probably two decades to really get the machine up and running in terms of climate disclosures. Uh, and it seems, and I'm quite convinced that's going to go much faster for, for nature, because again, we are, you know, building on the foundations that have been set up for, for, for climate. I think there's much more a sense of uh, urgency in the business community nowadays around climate, but also around nature. And I think what uh, Elizabeth and, and Camille said about COP15, where we really saw a very strong commitment from businesses, which was, you know, quite uh, surprising, also gives you know, some, some hope uh, going forward. And the other comment I wanted to make is that, and I agree with David on this, is that, you know, disclosures are not simply a question of compliance, of investor relationships. It's also a strategic question. And, you know, what, what we've seen with uh, TCFD, what we've seen with the taxonomy, in the European Union is that once you start to disclose on your performance, well, you you know, you, you're entering in a virtual cycle where you need to, where you want to show better results the year after. It, it's very clear on the taxonomy where we're seeing that it's influencing CapEx decisions. It's influencing decisions to invest. So, you know, I do think this is going to push in a good direction. I have some hope uh, engaging with some of our business partners and clients that a number of corporates are seeing the strategic dimension uh, beyond, you know, simply publishing uh, KPIs. It's also a question of repositioning your business. Very good. Thanks, Alexis. Uh, I want to turn to you, Judson. Uh, you've been leading our work on uh, the financial institutions working group and a lot of our thinking around sector guidance for financial institutions. Um, and that, that obviously transitions over into a book, is thinking about things like transition plans and scenarios. There's a few questions about what we're doing on scenarios. Uh, are we coming up with scenarios for nature? And what, if anything, might we be thinking about or likely to do in the future around uh, transition planning and uh, aligned to uh, Nature Positive or Montreal? You know, thanks, Tony. Um, yeah, I think this is also another place where TNFD can move things faster than TCFD for climate. I mean, I think we've, you know, we've learned, you know, in my own firm, UBS included, over the past few years, you know, what scenario analysis and can be useful for and what it doesn't achieve. And the whole concept of transition planning sort of came in a bit later in, in, the, in, the, in the game. But I think we have the chance with TNFD really to build out those two concepts from the beginning in parallel. Um, and in one article you know, that hasn't really been commented so much you know, in, the, in the session so far actually is the target 14 on aligning financial flows. I don't think we should you know, forget that one or underestimate that one. So honestly, that really is the provision that drove out the whole idea of transition planning in the financial sector. You know, it's not just aligning public flows, it's aligning private flows, including your know, CapEx and reinvestment flows by companies. So I think that really has the power to put the emphasis on essentially directing financial flows and, and moving them in a more, it, it, these words weren't in the framework, but the more nature positive um, you know, direction. So, so I think there is a lot of power in, that has been developed on transition planning and the extent that, that there can be lessons learned from the climate transition planning and the net zero plan, I think that, 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 that they'll be very well applied on the nature topic. Fantastic. Thanks, Judson. And for those particularly interested in scenarios, we have published a discussion paper on our, on our early thinking around scenarios. And we're actually now starting to pilot test that with a few of the task force member companies to see how that plays out at a company level. Uh, and then obviously we'll need to think about scenarios for financial institutions and how that connects to macro prudential scenarios um, being developed by the NGFS as the community of central banks. So um, there's lots of work happening on the, on the scenarios front. Um, Mayel, I wanted to bring you back in. Uh, there's there's a, an interesting question around, you're obviously working at the interface between policy and business. Um, so two questions, if I can, and maybe fairly quick responses, but one, one is around uh, what are the barriers to adoption? What, what do you see as the barriers to adoption for, for a disclosure framework like TNFD? Obviously the GBF has now asked for it, but what else might get in the way of this agenda really moving forward and scaling to adoption? And the second question um, that I think you can help to answer is uh, around the notion of nature positive. There's this term nature positive that's getting a lot of currency now, um, but it wasn't in the global biodiversity framework. Um, maybe you can speak to what's happening in the background with the global goals group and other things around nature positive and 
and, and how is that going to be defined as a reference point for market participants in the future? Thanks, Sunny. Maybe I'll start with the nature positive. Um, so yes, so there's this there's been this big movement calling for the concept of nature positive, which actually is very aligned with the current wording in the 2030 mission of the of the framework that Camille mentioned. So the the, the mission is the global goal of what the whole of society should be working towards, which is halting and reversing uh, the loss of nature by 2030, which is the equivalent of nature positive. So nature positive is more like a communication rallying, you know, movement, which is fully aligned with the current mission. So this is something it doesn't really matter at the end if it's in the text or not. It's really giving this global goal to everyone, which is the halting and reversing nature loss. Um, together with a lot of our partners, we've been working on like this, a discussion paper on what it means for businesses to be able to contribute to this mission. So the Nature Positive, I can put the link in the chat. And we've been drafting also together with, with TNFD and many others, this, this action framework that includes the, the assess, act, uh, act, commit, and, add, and disclose that links the different frameworks. So that kind of create a simple journey for businesses on where they can start on their journey towards contributing to a nature positive. So this this trying to simplify the landscape, because I think your second question takes me to the second question, which is what is you know the barriers. And I think a lot of the questions we get from businesses when they came to us say, where where do I start? It's the, the landscape is so confusing. Like how, you know, so we're trying with the businesses to work together with our partners to try to simplify this landscape and give some directions of where to start. And I think Kind of a similar similar bias, I think, from the government side. And we, when we were talking about Target 15 along the negotiation, we were really surprised on how many of the the government, the, the policymakers, and the government, the negotiators actually did the, did not know about TNFD, didn't know about SBTN. And I saw someone asking a question about the alphabet soup, and I think that's definitely what what also governments feel like. So I think there's a lot of work that we collectively need to do in sharing awareness raising and training i think there's another question saying like are we going to plan to help government develop their nb subs and giving training that's something we're looking at at business for nature we're going to be working in pilots in four countries um so if you're interested and you want to join and, and we really welcome any support but i think a lot of of, of yeah sharing material simplifying aligning and trying to make it sim as simple as we can both for the businesses that are new in the journey and that don't necessarily have the, the, the whole team and capacities to understand but also for government which is quite new for a lot of the environment ministry to work, start working with with, with, gov uh, with businesses so i think that's probably what we need to focus on in the next few years great thanks mail and just to build on your comments around capability building once tnfd gets the recommendations out in september uh, we will be working with others like business for nature issb um uh, sbtn uh pri and WBCSD, a whole number of organizations around this challenge of how do we help build capability so that companies and financial institutions have the confidence to, to act. Of course, most people today don't have experts on nature and biodiversity in their organizations. That's the same 10 years ago on climate. And now a lot of, a lot of companies, a lot of organizations are now, are now building or have access to climate expertise. We need to go down the same journey on nature. And over the next uh, five years, with some funding that we've we've now secured and was announced in Montreal, we'll be working with a wide range of partners to help build capacity around the TNFD framework so that we can drive up adoption. Um, there were two other quick things that I might comment on. I can see Emily's uh, had to leave us. And then I'm going to ask David to close in the last couple of minutes, um, maybe with some summary comments. Um, there was an interesting set of questions and a discussion around our interaction with the ISO and the standards that ISO has been developing. We're, we're in touch with the ISO team. Um, we're looking forward to further inter interactions with them. Um, clearly they're a preeminent standard setting body. So um, that's one of, the, one of the content partnerships that we, we have and we're looking to, to build out further. There was also um, some, some questions around other inputs and collaborations that we've been building. Uh, one was around GRI, who we speak to regularly. And um, the, there was another question around our interaction with Indigenous peoples and local communities. We've had a really fantastic dialogue uh, with a, a group of about 40 or 50 um, IPLC leaders from around the world over the last eight or nine months. Um, that's continuing. And um, for those interested in the social dimensions in particular, we published a discussion paper on that in November. It's on our website. 
we're seeking feedback and uh, comments and responses from all of you on those issues and we'll continue to engage both IPLC leaders as well as civil society organisations um, to bring their input into the, into the process. And that's likely to crystallise both around the disclosure recommendations and, uh, and the supporting guidance on stakeholder, including rights holder engagement. So all of that's coming together as a part of the um, uh, additional guidance that we're pulling together. So um, we're almost out of time. I do wanna allow David to um, maybe summarize and wrap up and offer some final thoughts and reflections from what he's heard from this discussion. David, over to you. Well, thank you, Tony, and thank you everyone for joining this call. Uh, and thank you for investing time on this really important topic. Uh, I want to quickly thank our team, especially our guest speakers, uh, Mayor, Alexis, Emily, Judson, um, for sharing their insights. And also thank you for the questions. We didn't pick up, obviously, all of the questions that were asked. Uh, we will try and pick up the ones that we didn't and publish that. I think it'd be quite useful. I think everyone is saying to do that. Uh, I think you heard from Elizabeth and Camille that the GBF with its 23 targets, its four goals, is a very ambitious framework to ensure that we really do live with harmony in nature and try to halt this degradation of nature and biodiversity, which is not just harming the natural system and destroying it in many areas, but harming the communities, the businesses and the economies that depend upon them. Disclosures are important, as I answered in the question, because they demonstrate accountability. And, and what we're hearing from all of our speakers um, is the business and financial environment is aligning around taking more accountability, accountability for assessment, for managing, not just disclosing against nature related dependencies, the impacts and risks. Um, I would stress a couple of things that if um, disclosures on their own are meaningless, it's what's really important is that companies have invested the time, the talent, the knowledge and the skills. And for financial investors, they need to understand where these nature dependencies and risks are because they want to allocate their capital to ensure they're mitigated. So in terms of barriers, I've always thought that the biggest barrier is knowledge and expertise. So the sooner that you start, um, the better. Um, to build the expertise and to build the knowledge. So I'll just offer three, if you like, succinct takeaways for everyone on the call, uh, in particular for business and finance leaders for whom this call is really directed and might be just thinking, well, how do I engage on the GBF targets and the topic, how do I use the TNFD? I think one is don't just underestimate the urgency of the crisis, but also the urgency of the movement. The GBF agreement is ambitious and it's real. Targets will be set by governments and businesses and we'll see growing pressure and action to align on these targets. And you heard from Elizabeth that the next COP will be towards the end of next year. Um, target 15 means that disclosures on nature impacts the dependencies and risk is coming. And um, we're seeing more and more activities support these. TNFD is a framework and a tool to obviously support against target 15, but as Judson and many others said, all the other targets as well, which are incredibly important. And ultimately, our goal is to redirect financial investments into those nature positive outcomes. Our task force members who do the design work of this themselves just have just have 20 trillion of assets under management. So their commitment and their engagement, as you can see, is important to redirect trillions of dollars into nature positive outcomes and away from doing harm. And if you're not already, I would encourage you to engage in the TNFD through the pilots, in the forum, in the national consultation groups. Testing, developing and learning is as important as the end product. It really builds the experience and it builds something that's been market tested. So my final ask is, if you're not already, um, please do get involved with that, in that and, and get ahead of what the leaders will be doing, which is starting to build the talent and the knowledge that is required uh, to address this really immensely strategic crisis and issue that the world is facing and to redirect financial flows back to nature positive outcomes. Again, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you for our speakers. Thank you for the questions. And we look forward to further engagement with you. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.